Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the like button, the notification bell, and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. Today I have Don Dawkin of the legendary band with his own name, Dawkin. How are you doing, Don? Mm, doing great. It's really nice out today. I'm sitting out in my patio and 70 degrees and... I got a week and a half off, which is nice. We've been on the road nonstop for six months, so everything is good. Awesome. Uh, you look like it's a little chilly where you are, but you're up in the mountains of uh, Santa Fe. Like you're about an hour behind Santa Fe, South of it? I had, no, I'm only like 15 minutes outside the town. Okay, but you're high up in the mountains, higher. Oh, yeah, 8,000 feet. Wow. So you, I, I, you obviously like that... Um, that area you came from um california what what made you um relocate was it just uh all the crap going on in la and you just needed to get yep. out of there or? yep i mean you know i i was, originally i was just looking to buy a second house for an investment and i had a girlfriend live in new mexico and she'd fly to la and i'd go to new mexico and she's an ex-model and she'd say i lived in la for years i hate it mm -hmm. you know but it seemed like every time I got off the road in my house in L.A., it's just more crowded, more traffic, more crime. And, you know, I just decided I wanted to be honest. I wanted to drop out. I wanted to buy a home somewhere within an hour and a half of L.A. so I can see my kids where I had no neighbors, no nothing, just privacy. And I found this weird old church up in a mountain. They've been sitting empty for years and on 25 acres and I had no neighbors and I had a beautiful view of the city. And I said, I'm done with LA. I mean, LA, even my daughter who lives there, she said, dad, you sold the right time. LA turned into a shithole. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. the homeless people situation is off the charts, not as bad as San Francisco, but I mean, there's these blue tarps the city gave everybody and you'll drive down like, or the rainbow or the whiskey. And there's just blue tarps on the sidewalks because people sleep under them for the rain. It, it, I don't know where all these people came from. And they said, oh, COVID. I said, well, the whole the COVID's dying down. How did this homeless situation, San Francisco, Chicago, LA, what, what, what's going on? Seattle, pretty bad. Seattle, it's terrible. And then he had the new influx of fentanyl from the Chinese. Yeah. And we're having 250 deaths a day. And, you know, and people say, oh, well, they got PTSD or, you know, they're depressed or they're drug addicts. I said, not all of them. Just right. go back to work. But it's our fault as Americans when they go, I can go back to work or the government will pay me 2000 a month and an ATM card to buy groceries and I don't need to work. So that's what's going on in L.A. Yeah, Canada, we're having the same problem with um, the uh, population. Um, they can't fill jobs quick enough. Um, and in Canada, we had what's called CERB, the uh, Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. And it was 2000 a month. And so uh, I think that's uh, made a few people feel that they're entitled. And so yeah. Yeah, we're having the same problem here. I'm getting people to go back to work. Why would you want to work if you're getting $2,000 a month and a food card? Mm -hmm. Screw it. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of people lost their home. They said, da, 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 da. I said, well, that's not really true because they put the moratorium. You couldn't kick anybody out. I have several friends that own homes and people haven't paid their rent in two years. Oh, wow. But you can't kick them out. But yeah. you still have to make your house payment to the bank every month. Yeah. You still have to pay your mortgage. So they're squatting. Yeah. So the world's gone upside down. That was kind of one of the reasons I made the album Heaven Comes Down. It's like the apocalypse. We got the Ukraine war, yeah. $197 billion to the Ukraines. The Russians are hacking us. I mean, look what happened to Vegas last week. They literally hacked into Vegas and shut all the slot machines down. Was that last week? Yeah, I remember reading yeah. something um, about the casinos. Um, I didn't know it was particular Vegas because we had that happen up in Canada uh, a few yeah. months ago. Yeah. No, they got to Vegas. We're talking the MGM, you know, the Aladdin, the big hotels. And all of a sudden, all the machines went dark. 
Wow. Kept it blank. And then they said, you want them to turn back on? Give us $100 million. <laughs> wow. yeah. And they traced it back, government, and it's the Russians. You know? It's like, if we can't conquer America, we'll just do it on the back door. Yeah. So uh, there were literally people in Vegas, when you win, they pay you in cash. Because oh, the whole okay. system crashed. And they said, hey, we'll turn it back on. Just give us $100 million. So that's scary, you know? Yeah. And now they're going after the banks. And, you know, yeah, I could go to my bank tomorrow and get an ATM and put my card in and go, balance nothing or we can't you can't get in so the world's in a very precarious place right now yes and that's why i live how i wrote the song fugitive from life yeah you know? i was going to ask you about that well obviously i know what's behind it but um yeah you you kind of described it yeah i just said i'm out i'm done you know i'm gonna go buy a home uh up on a mountain i bought the whole mountain I didn't want anybody building next to me or behind me. And, right. and I just said, what the hell? But then again, in New Mexico, they say last night, uh, there was 4,000 legal aliens were coming in a week, you know, into Texas and then go to New Mexico. And now it's 8,000 people a day. Yeah, a I heard day. that's getting insane. Like it was bad before for you guys, but um, it's just crazy right now. It's almost like they're, advertising for it and what and, i mean how are we gonna house these people they're putting up in for the government's renting out hotels and putting them in a hotel and giving them a car to buy groceries i'm like well of course they're happy but i don't believe that the whole country of mexico wants to come to america you this know it's true yeah there's a lot of um misconception about mexico even in canada here <clears throat> people think it's all dirt roads and there's a lot of money in mexico tons they have oil yeah. i've been to mexico i played there mexico city's beautiful mm -hmm. you got alcapoco and puerto Vallarta and in baja and and i mean eight thousand people a day what is texas supposed to do right you know they're renting out like arenas and large venues and putting bounds of bed and they go what are we supposed to do with these people and and the governor got oh, Ted said put them on a bus send them back look it's our constitution yeah. you know the scottish the english came here in the 1700s and everybody has a right to go anywhere they want but you you apply for a green card and you apply for citizenship and but they're just going across the river. Because I live here with local news, the, the camera's showing just thousands of people walking over this one spot where it's only four feet deep. And they got babies they're carrying. A lot of babies are drowning because it's very high current. And by the governor of Texas said, I'm not going to listen to the government. I don't want them coming over. We can't support them. They put these big balls in the Rio Grande so you can't go over mm. and barbed wire. I watched the news last night and there were people just cutting the barbed wire with wire cutters and climbing through the barbed wire with with the Border Patrol standing there and doing nothing. They're just standing there watching them cut the barbed wire and come in. Wow. I'm like, well, that's wrong. But, you know, everybody has a right to go anywhere they want. But if you or I... Like I'm thinking about moving to France if Trump wins. And if you move to England or France or Spain, you can't stay there. You can stay there for, you know, eight weeks. You, gotta, you can't just stay there. They'll kick you out. You can't say, oh, I'm living here now. Give me money. You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm going to come to your country and I want you to pay me to do that. Yeah. yeah. I want an apartment. I've got four kids. And give me a place to live and you just it's not doable it's it's philanthropic that we could take all these people in but uh looking at the statistics three million illegal aliens in the last year three million yeah i know it's a uh, lot of people you wonder when they scatter kind of... once they get across the board they just scatter yeah and crime will just go up because like he's like right now there's um 
extremely serious. Well, it's always serious, but there's an extreme um, problem with homelessness. And then you have all these extra illegal aliens or legal, whatever you want to call it. But that's that's why crime goes up. And yeah, we don't know what's behind the real reasoning, but it's just, yeah, I can understand uh, the frustration. We just got voted. New Mexico is the, uh, not here in Santa Fe, but an hour away in Albuquerque just got voted the highest crime rate, murder rate, and suicide rate in the country. Wow. They all go to Albuquerque. It's a big city. Santa Fe is a little, little tiny town, mm -hmm. like in the burbs. And we are literally, of the whole United States, highest crime rate, highest murder rate, uh, fentanyl deaths ravaging 200 a day. Wow. And the police are quitting because they said, you know, if you call 911 and say, you know, my boyfriend's beating the crap out of me and come to me and they look at your address and you're kind of out in some dirt road, they, they won't come because they're going to get shot. Wow. That's, that's geez, what do you say to that? Pretty weird, um, huh? Yeah. Who would have thought after the 80s, the glory days of hard rock, I lived in LA my whole life, who would have thought that the world had gone upside down in 30 years? And you got, but it's not just merits of Spain, Italy, England. I was talking to Mickey D from the Scorpions and he lives in Copenhagen. He goes, we got gypsies at the train stations begging for money. And they're, you know, now I got this new thing. It's called, uh, you probably saw it where you'll have like 10 people with masks on, go to Beverly Hills, smash the windows and run into a jewelry store, 10 of them. And grab like a million dollars in watches and jewelry and diamonds and run out wow. in five minutes before the cops even show up. And the people work, what are you going to do in 10 people? It's an, I, I don't, there's a term for it, but now the, the gangs at the Crips and the Bloods and B13, they're organized. And they say, okay, we'll go to Beverly Hills and hit this store. And there'll be 10 of us and we'll just rush the store and smash everything. Swarming, we'll isn't it swarming? Swarming, yeah. Okay. And they're out of there with a half a million dollars and shit in five minutes. Wow. Clothing stores, Versace, you name it. Who would have thought that would happen in Beverly Hills, you know? Yeah. So the world's changing, and that's why some of the lyrics I wrote in the album were about the world is changing, you know? So it's coming out October 27th. Is there any um, surprise uh, musicians that you had play on it besides the band? No. No, so uh, you know. well, Mark Bowles, who's a very well known singer, he did a lot of the Ingbe Malmsteen records. Great singer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't sing as high as I used to do in the 80s. I mean, I've talked to so many musicians, we sang so high up in the yeah. alto range. And then, you know, 30 years goes by and you, your voice, you just can't go that high. But, you know, some people can. And Mark sang a lot of background vocals on the new Dawkin album. And, and that was about it, you know. Well, that's a testament to you. Actually, I was watching uh, some live stuff you've done recently, and I noticed in certain songs, I don't know if it's Alone Again or some of the um, your, the biggest hits from Dawkins, but you weren't trying to hit those notes. You're actually playing and singing at a, um, an, an octave below, which is yeah. better than, um, and yeah, I'm sure you'd agree, better than trying to reach a note and just blowing it. And so that's a... That's a, a shout out to you for for recognizing your voice changes and not trying I own to. It. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have a, a lot of acronyms or analogies, but, you know, if you build a race car for the D500 and the motor is brand new and you win, and then you use the same motor next year and he came in second, and then you use the same motor and don't touch it and you come in sixth, you know, I. When I was, you know, in my 20s, and I remember I turned 30 on the Dio tour, you know, but now I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of concerts. Yeah, my voice took a hit. You know, it's it's it gets wear and tear. And I finally said, you know, I don't need to prove anything to anybody. Right. You know, I was hitting like these crazy soprano notes in Tooth mm -hmm. and Nail, Iron Lock and Key, but I did it. And if, if the fans sometimes post, oh, Don can't hit you know, the nine notes and he can't sing as high as he used to. I'm just trying to sing the lyrics and be emotional and sing good. 
Yeah. So yeah, I brought it down. I brought it down a bit. I don't need to prove anything anymore. No, oh, and you're still a good singer. It's just uh, you're you're adjusting for just like I'm adjusting. You're cold, you put a jacket on. Yep. And when I started writing this record, I'm. I thought I'll I'll just try to sing high as I can, hit those crazy high notes like me and Halford used to do. And and I said I don't need to do this anymore. I can do it. You know, if I do one show, I can hit all the high notes. Right. But if I have a show the next day, flying, traveling, no sleep, driving, you know, I'm I'm tired. I'm worn out. Yeah. The 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 um your vocal cords. You know, they're they're a muscle, or a they're a muscle. Yeah, and I found out uh, in the mid '90s. I was having problems with my voice. What the hell's going on? You know, I do my vocal exercises and I do everything, and went to the doctor, and, and he said, "Man, your vocal cords are like bright red." Mm -hmm. I said, "Really?" And he goes, "And you have your tonsils, and they're inflamed." Why? I haven't been on the road in six months, and he goes, "Something's going on." So I went to a sleep study center. Okay. And they watch you as you sleep. And he goes, Don, you, you're snoring like crazy. So if you do that. He goes, if you're snoring all night, you're going to wake up. You're going to wake up hoarse. Right. This is trashing your vocal cords. So they have a thing called a CPAP. You put a mask on and yeah. in, a, in a machine and you put it on when you go to sleep. And that helped a lot. But and the doctor said, you need to have scar tissue. And I went, he goes, nothing we can do. You're not 30 years old anymore. I just turned 70 in June. Why not? Yeah, so, I couldn't believe that, to be honest with you. Yeah, you you know, still I got my baby face when I don't have a beard. But I said, well, you know, the doctors go, you can have surgery, you can do this, you can do that. I was talk. we were on tour with Cinderella and... Uh, what's his name? The singer, uh, Bon Kiefer. And Tom didn't sing for like three years, and he had surgery. And I guess they put like titanium plates in his vocal cords, and he had to go to vocal. Lab. He didn't sing for three years. He lost his voice, and we played. And he was singing just like he did when he was younger. And I was talking to Tom, and he said, "Yeah, I, but you know, he sang really high." Mm -hmm. I mean, take me all day. I mean, he was singing so yeah. high. But we never realized that when we're in our 20s or 30s that we might have to maintain that in our 50s or 60s. So, and Tom said, yeah, I had to stop singing for years and surgery and this and that. And, you know, I said, well, it sucks, you know. But and I don't understand why the fans complain. I'm out there doing the best I can. That's all I can do, you know. Well, you got yes, keyboard you know. warriors uh, that don't have any accountability because they're showing up as a you know a color. They're not in front of you saying that. So I mean, you just can take a grain, take that with a grain of salt. I would say. Yeah, I, my daughter when she was younger, and people would say, "Oh, don't you give it up?" and blah blah blah. And I say, Jessica, don't respond. Yeah, I said, this guy works at Subway Sandwiches, making tuna sandwiches. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a life. And I had this one guy who used to come on our site every night, every day. And I saw Dawkins six times this year. They saw, Don sucked. Well, why'd you come six times? <laughs> why the extra five? Yeah. Yeah. Because he wants attention. Yeah. You know, and I'd look and I'd say, well, I'm singing good. I'm just not singing as high as I used to. And I can name... 10 singers that can't sing like they used to. Oh, yeah. Easy, yeah. you know. But then you got these people that are like gifted by God. Uh, Glenn Hughes, mm -hmm. in his late 70s, sings just like he did when he did the Burn Album and Deep Purple. Ryan James Dio never changed. He sounded amazing till the last album he did at the live album, the Radio City Music Hall. I actually popped in the studio one day. And he just sounded like amazing. And he was in his seventies. And I'm like, some people have a gift, you know? Yeah. Like, like I said, the whole thing is about everybody's body's different. So yeah, certain people can answer. So you. I made it a conscious effort on the new album to sing in a comfortable range because I wanted to emote the lyrics and have my voice clear. 
I don't want to go ah, and try to hit the high note mm-hmm. where they go, hey, and it comes out. So I said, I have nothing. I realized nothing to prove. I'm just about good songs, good music, good choruses, good band. I have nothing to prove. So that's why the, the album, I'm still singing pretty high on the record. Mm-hmm. But I just uh, just wanted to sing in my comfortable range. And, you know, we've been playing. We just had 7,000 people three days ago and everybody seemed happy. Yeah, you were telling me that was on the uh, East Coast and, and it was yeah. in Boston? Massachusetts, yeah, the Big E. Wow, wow. We had 7,000 people. And that is a historical kind of a festival. The Big E's been going on for 30 years. And unfortunately, it had been raining for weeks. So we had a terrible turnout. You know, you know, you got rides and this and that and this. And the day we played, beautiful skies. The moon was out, 70 degrees. You know, and we had 7,000 turnout. And they said, wow, we've never even had that much turnout for one of the bands, the different bands every night. And we had a great show, you know. I'm sure somebody will post it on YouTube. I was making a joke on stage saying, I love playing fairs because I get a corn dog. I don't eat corn dogs. I only eat them when I'm playing a fair, some kind of a mental thing. And I said, man, I, I can't wait to get off stage and get a corn dog. So about toward the end of the stage, all of a sudden I looked to the right. Some guy was holding a corn dog. Like yeah. a foot. And I was like, oh, man. So I ran over there. I took a big bite of it. The band started playing, and I was like still chewing, <laughs> eating my corn dog. I was shit. I had to set it down so I could start singing. It's okay. something about fairs and corn dogs. Or cotton never... candy, right? Huh? Or cotton candy. Fairs and cotton I don't like candy. Cotton. I don't like Yeah, it's funny. I don't like cotton candy. Yeah, it's too sweet. It's just sugar. Yeah. And sugar it kind of does me out. But uh, corn dogs, if it's crispy, deep fried properly. Uh, we played about four weeks ago, and they had nine corn dogs in our dressing room. And my band was saying, "What's with you and corn dogs?" I said, "Try one." So they all tried it, and they were like, "Oh man, this is awesome!" I go, "Make sure you put mustard on it," and and they were like, "These are awesome," you know. So yeah, it was I'm kind of check one of those out because I've I've never had one, but I mean, I, I know a lot of people were going to say to me now, they're like, "What are you talking about? I never have." So. How many tracks are on the album? It's coming out October 27th, and you've had two. Are you going to be releasing one more single? Um, Fugitive and G- Gypsy are out now. Is there going to be another release before the album? Uh, I just had the discussion last week with my guitar player, John Levin, who's very good friends with Robbie, who manages Extreme. And he said, you know, Extreme's going to put out a video for every song on their record. And I went, that's smart. So you keep the record alive, you know? Yeah media so you guys put out 10 videos yeah it costs money but i said i think we'll do that so i've already started on the next single already even though Fair gypsies yes yeah and fugitives over half a million the record company was really against me uh making that video as far as the money they gave me like enough money i said well i can film this video on an iphone but it's our first record. I want the video to be amazing. Mm-hmm. So luckily I live in Santa Fe. There's a thing called Meow Wolf here. Mm-hmm. It's an art installation. Now there's one in Denver and one in Vegas. And I talked to the owner and said, we'd like to film it in Meow Wolf. So we rented it out and we filmed. And we brought in like 5K cameras, movie cameras, professional. Uh, Chris Air, who's the known director for the series Dark Winds. Mm-hmm. And Tom Strick Fadden, who did live from the sun one live night i flew him in from austin and we brought in all the best gear we could get steady cams everything and i said this video has to be you know interesting and cool it, we could have made a video for the first single and just go rent a stage in a rehearsal room like we did it's just another day when i did the document union video and just go on stage and lip sync and you know, edit it and put it out there. I didn't want to do that. You know, I thought we got to do something a little trippy, like Fugitive. So we did. There's a lot of hidden meanings in that video with John walking by and motioning me to come follow him. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, Don, we're not done yet. Let's go. Yeah. So we did it. And uh, 
you know, I said, well, I don't, I don't care what the record company wants to pay. I'll pay. I can afford it. Mm -hmm. And I proved my point. We're way over half a million views, half a million. Yeah. It's only video. Yeah. Half a million. That's a lot. Cause you know, I understand the world, you know, people go on YouTube now, there's so much content and they click on a doc and video or Warren or center, whoever, and they watch for a minute and they go to the next video and the next video. You know, everybody seems to have a short attention span now. Yeah, that's true. I want people to watch the whole video top to bottom. So I said, I don't care what this is going to cost. I'll just get my checkbook out, you know? So we did it. And then I said, well, next video, let's do something really off the wall. We did an animated video. Yeah. You know, see Gypsies out animated, but a very old school animation and, so I think that's really cool. And that thing's going through the roof. So we'll probably do like the extreme, uh, what they plan on doing. I'm going to make it another video and another video and another video because the album comes out October 27th. We plan on going to Europe in June, May or June, and then Japan and in the summer. So that's six, seven months apart. I don't want the record to disappear. So as long as you keep putting out social media content and YouTube videos, you keep the record alive. Yeah. It just depends if you can afford it. A lot of these bands had one or two hits in the 80s. They can't afford to make 10 videos. I get it. Mm -hmm. I understand, you know, but that's not me. I don't have that problem. So, and I don't care who says this is the budget. I just get out my credit card, you know? <laughs> there you go. Um, I got into docking back in the day, obviously a lot of people my age. Um, what would you say your um, favorite album is? Um, let's let's take this one out of the equation, okay? Let's take um, Heaven Comes Down out of the equation. If you were to be nailed down as one album that you, for some reason, personally think is your favorite, um, what would that be? Our Least Successful is my most favorite, and that was Dysfunctional. I was just going to say that, yeah. I mean, the one where George came in and played a solo. Yeah, well, he had nothing to do with the record, but he came in at the last second and took the solo on two out of five. That was a, a record company management kind of a. Uh, well, I just, you know, when I was making dysfunctional, uh, you know, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in studios, you know, for Tooth and Nail, break, not breaking the chains, but all the other albums, and I said, this is crazy, because you know. It, they pay, but they take it out of your royalties. Yeah. And I said, for that kind of money, I could build my own studio. So I called Michael Wagner, you know, and I said, I want to build a studio, you know, my own. And he's an amazing engineer. Plus he's a technician. And he just, I just bought this 3000 square foot building and we just built a studio. And I said, and he said, you should just do everything old school. English consoles, English equipment, no Pro Tools, tape machines. And we were buying things on eBay, like, say it was a $4,000 compressor, but it was broken. And Michael would say, don't worry about it, buy it, I'll fix it for 200 bucks. And he was soldering for months, fixing all this very vintage gear that Deep Purple and all these bands in the 1670s and 70s used. We were buying old equipment because he wanted that classic sound. My console was English API. So I built my own studio and then we started writing dysfunctional without any, you got six weeks to write a record, hurry up, let's go. You know, you're under pressure to write three great songs and then the rest is filler. And I didn't want to do that. And I'm like, nope. And plus it gave me the, the vehicle to stretch out. I had sitars and weird guitars and different tunings and trippy harmonies, very Crosby, Stills and Nash, Beatlesque and Zeppelin. And that's why I like dysfunctional because nobody was telling me what to do. You know, I just wrote what I wanted to write. And all these record companies were approaching me wanting to sign us. We had no record deal. And they'd say, we'll sign you as long as it sounds like tooth and nail meets back the attack. I'm like, guys, it's 30 years ago. I mean, my my spirit, my soul, my life experience, I don't 
relate to those songs anymore. I'm in a different world now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I'm just going to write what I write. When the universe comes down to me and I'm playing guitar and I get inspired, I take my little tape recorder and I record it. And then we demo it and then we do it again and we do it for real. So a lot of labels were chasing me and I said, nope, you know, I'm going to write and whatever comes out, comes out. So I finished Dysfunctional. Several labels said, uh, it's not like Tooth and Nail or Back to the Attack. It's not classic Dawkins. I'm like, well, it's me singing and there's harmonies and it's melodic and the songs are catchy. What's the problem? Yeah. So it was very frustrating. So we put it out on Geffen Records or no, Columbia Records. And, you know, it sold 400,000 copies. Mm -hmm. Even though John Kalodner, famous a &R guy, said the label doesn't believe in Duncan. They think that this style of music is finished. You know, they were all about Whitney Houston and all the and Michael Jackson on Columbia. Mm -hmm. They didn't care about Duncan. So when we sold the four hundred thousand, they didn't repress it. So you couldn't find the record; just died. And that's just the way it was. Same problem when I was in Geffen. I put out up from the ashes. They had Nirvana, Guns N' Roses. Nirvana exploded, changed everything into the grunge world in the nineties. They had Guns N' Roses that took off. And all of a sudden they're like, eh, Doc, and you know, they're a hair band. I said, oh, I hate that term. We're not a hair band. But they'd always pick the most commercial song on their records to put on MTV. In My Dreams, Into the Fire, The Hunter, Alone Again, It's Not Love, Just Got Lucky. Any jam. hardcore Dawkins fans, we, yeah, we had our metal side. Tooth and Nail, Lightning Strikes Again, Till the Living End. You know, we had the heavy side too, but, and because we had big hair, I don't know, but I think Geffen realized that, you know, oh, this is the new future. And then all of a sudden in the middle of our campaign, David Geffen sold the company and left after 30 years being on Warner Brothers and sold his company to MCA because he wanted to do DreamWorks, and make movies. Mm -hmm. So we were caught in the middle, you know, the promotion staff, Nobody takes your cars. Nobody's promoting the record. So we just went on tour and did the best we could. And that's why I took, you know, four years off, you know, because look, there was Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Nirvana. And it's interesting. It's sad that all these great bands, they were great. I don't care if they were grunge. They wrote some good music. Mm -hmm. and, but what happened? All those band singers are dead. Yeah. They're all dead. Yeah. They hang themselves commit suicide uh chris cornell was a genius in my opinion oh yeah where was doing great he goes his hometown of detroit plays a show i saw the bootleg video he had kids and a wife who goes back to his hotel and hangs himself yeah what the hell was that all about yeah that was um well i mean that's got me like people into the music industry just stood it's like a where were you during 9 11 it's one of those things too. I remember where I was when I found out Chris, and then a year later, his good friend, um, um, Chester Bennington. Chester Bennington, he killed himself too. Yeah, on the anniversary of, uh, I believe, it was on the anniversary of uh, Chris's passing. Yeah, he did it on that day. I don't understand. Yeah, you know, Benning was great. Chris was great. Chris was doing movie soundtracks. Great voice. Great artist. I don't know, man. I, I've had depression. Yeah. You know, I got paralyzed. Uh, my career went down. You know, I just hung in there. But I could never imagine taking my own life, especially with children. I'm sorry. There's a beautiful world out there. You just have to find it. Yeah. That's the uh... homeless people. If they don't go to a park, look at the trees, look at the bushes, look at the flowers. Instead of sitting there on a sidewalk feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah. You know, when I travel around the country, I have to, I, I kind of laugh because every store says now hiring Starbucks, $70 an hour now hiring. Everybody's hiring. So why are you sleeping on the sidewalk? Go work. You know, when we're born on this planet, God didn't tell you or me saying you're going to be born. And I promise you'll have a wonderful life. You know, you 
make what you want out of life. And I was raised in that situation. You know, I lived in an orphanage till I was six and then foster homes, different foster homes till I was 14 or 15. You know, you make what you want out of life. My escape was guitar. You know, I live in a foster home. There was eight of us in a three bedroom, bunk beds. I'd come home sixth, seventh grade. I have my little guitar my mom bought me, hundred bucks. And I go in the garage, you know, with a little amplifier and I practice and listen to records. That was my escape. Yeah, um, I mean, and you or me, anybody can make it. Maybe you won't be a rock star or a rocket scientist or invent some new, t you won't be Bill Gates or that asshole that owns Twitter. Uh, what's his <laughs> name? Billionaire. Musk. He stole that technology. If you really look at the, the two kids in college invented Facebook. And he basically Are you talking about Zuckerberg. Yeah, Zuckerberg. He ripped him off. And he finally, they sued him and he, he gave him like two million bucks. Now he's a billionaire. He didn't invent Facebook. I heard he that just, about Gates as well, about Microsoft. There's some other people involved. Oh yeah, Gates didn't design the computer or the, the Mac or PC or, you know, other people had done it, you know. They just but used them as the poster boy, the face. They bailed, they bailed. And, and Gates stayed in the game. My neighbor, when I lived at my house in Beverly Hills, was uh, his partner uh, who died of cancer. Uh, having a brain moment. I thought it was Larry. Is it? No, it's not, it's not Larry. No, there was Bill Gates and the other guy. Yeah, I'll put the picture up in, when I edit it. And, you know, they started. He was the guy that really got it going. But he got cancer and passed away. He was my neighbor and he was a musician. And when I moved in, I said, oh my God, uh, Steve Allen, that was his name. Oh, that's right. Paul, yeah. Paul Allen. Oh, yes. He lived above me and we met because he had just bought like 10 acres on top of a mountain and he was building like some insane mansion. And he'd already installed electricity and fiber optics. And I said, oh man, I wish I had fiber optics for my internet. So I could have lightning speed internet. I could do editing and upload videos. And he said, oh, no problem. I'll, I'll tell him to run a line down to your house. And I went, really? So I ended up with like crazy high internet stuff. And he was a really sweet guy. And, and he said, you know, I have a 747. And sometimes when we're flying to England, I have a drum set, amplifiers, a PA. And they would go on the plane and jam on the plane on the way to England. Well, I said, you're, you're shitting me, right? And he goes, no, we just jam. We have we have this whole like rehearsal room on on the 747. And he said, you should come sometime. He was a Dawkins fan. And I said, well, that's awesome. And it was hilarious. And I said, I'd love to go do that sometime. And tragically, he got cancer. So oh. um, there's a lot of people the Bill Gates and the Zuckerbergs and, you know, I don't, if I had that kind of money, I would be supporting shelters for dogs and animals and, and being th philanthropic. I mean, you couldn't spend that money if you tried. Yeah. No, Billions, you, you know, even though Bill Gates says, you know, all my money is going to be given to charity when I die. Da, 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 da. But at the same time, he's buying up, all the farmland in the U.S. because he's now changed to agriculture and he's invested in genetically, you know, seeds to grow bigger crops and and he's buying up like all the farms and pushing the, the little guys, the little farmers out of business. He just buys them out. So I'm on the fence about Bill Gates's philanthropic <laughs> Yeah, you know, he's, you know, I'm going to give all my money away and blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, I'm still going to make more billions and screw the little farmer. Yeah. So it's like this, right? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if you had a billions of dollars or me? What, I, what would I do with it? You want to help the planet. 
You feet. live off the interests extremely comfortable. You couldn't spend the interest if you tried. No, that's it, yeah. Millions of dollars a day. You'd want to feed the homeless and build shelters and go to Africa and, and, and you know, where places are a mess. You know, I went to India eight years ago and I was shocked. I wanted to go to India, see the Taj Mahal and New Delhi. And I went there. I, I was just shocked. Yeah, they have a caste system. You have the upper class, middle class, and the what they call the untouchables. Right. And it, and it all depends how dark your skin is. Yeah. A lot of Indians have very dark skin. And if you have really dark skin, you can't get a job. You can't go to school. You can't go to college. You can't get a job as a waiter in a, in a five-star hotel. You can clean toilets. You can empty the trash. You can scoop up the elf and shit off the streets. But they can't, just because their skin's dark. And I'm like, I had this, you know, false perception of, of Nehru and Gandhi and trying to pull the Muslims and the Hindus and the, and the Buddhists together. And I went there and I was like, oh my God, there's these levels of culture. And I found it very sad, you know? Yeah. I'll never go back there again. I mean, I stayed in five-star hotels every night. You walk out the gate and there's trash piled 14 feet high. Stinks to high heaven. Yeah, well, their population is like one sixth of the planet. There's over a million people. I think they're on target, or they surpassed China as the most populous country at 1.5 billion people. Yeah, there's a lot of people in India, and I'm all for having kids and this and that. But if you're poor, you shouldn't have seven children. Yeah, I mean, what the hell? You know, do what's sustainable. Yeah, in the European countries, they have two. China, you're only allowed to have two. Yeah, that's true. I, it was what thirty years ago they put that kind of a moratorium on um, children. Birth. Yeah, and if you had a third one, and you were a girl, they drown you. Yeah, drown I knew there was something about um, females in that equation as well. I didn't know what they did to them, but it's terrible. In mandatory hysterectomies and blah blah blah. And the point I think we're getting to is the new generation doesn't know about that. They don't care. All they care about is TikTok and Twitter. Instagram. And, FaceTime and Instagram. They don't care that there's countries that women have to have mandatory hysterectomies or if you have a third child, they have to drown it. And, you know, and India where... You know, if your skin's too dark, can't get a job. You can't even go to school. You can't go to college just because your skin's dark. Yeah. Because that's a, another sect of Indian population. But the new generation doesn't know about all this. I've been lucky enough to travel around the world probably 10 times. And I see everything. You know, I, India and Thailand and Vietnam. And I've been all over the world many, many, many times. And you see the world is just unraveling and but of course i always say wow i'm going back to america no matter how bad it is in the u.s we're still the best country in the world beyond canada i think canada's great but the u.s is still the best country in the world we're democratic yeah. and these other countries uh i don't understand you know this mentality and, and it inspires me, unfortunately, to write music and write lyrics, you know. Yeah. And I had this false premise because I studied Buddhism most of my life. I was basically a practicing Buddhist. And oh, I'll go to India and I'll find some spiritual enlightenment. And Oh, yeah, well, you know, those people, they call me untouchables when they have dark skin. I saw Taj Mahal. I went all over India. And you see, like, really, really serious poverty. Yeah. But they, but they keep breeding more and more babies. When you think a husband and wife say, "We got four kids, let's stop." No, we'll have nine. You know. Yeah. It's uh. It's, and they're all starving to death. It's it's a little it's complicated too because I remember reading about that and 
in Africa, but I remember reading a lot of the tribes, they were having that many babies because the infant mortality rate was pretty high. So yeah, a lot true. of the children wouldn't live past three. So I think it's not a, it's, it's kind of a, not a very flattering term, but it's a form of gambling. They know that they only have so uh, much of a chance of their, say their daughter going on to the next generation. They're going to have three because they know that the chances of two of them passing before five are pretty high. Absolutely. You have six kids to survive. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I get it. Because the disease and the cholera and diphtheria and the bad water and hepatitis and starvation you know, and starvation. And I get it. They're trying to survive and, and propagate their family lineage. Mm -hmm. Watching a show the other night, it's called, uh, it was a weird show. My girlfriend said, I don't want to watch this. And it was about people that are born with like an arm growing out of their back and yeah, and their heads are real big and they have these very bizarre deformities. But it's inbreeding. You know, when you live in a village for 200 years and you never leave that village, you know, more than two miles away and people get married, 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 married and they inbreed and you end up with these crazy eighth generation uh what the hell's the name of that show and it's all most of those children are from india and impoverished countries and they're born with you know literally the other night the kid had an arm grown out of his back and the other kid had a tumor it was twice the size of his head and you know and i'm like holy moly because it's genetic malfunction yeah i mean there's a reason why you're not supposed to inbreed dogs Mm -hmm. you know they say don't ever in you know never have a dog have puppies with the sister after a couple of generations you have problems you know yeah. and that's why you got the puppy breeders they take one dog and one female and they make a shitload of puppies and they're all messed up there is some science to that you know but i tried to get into that all now i'm just living my life i'm retired did my last record. I just love playing. But unfortunately, I'm sensitive to seeing what's going on in the world, you know, with what's going on. Because I've met so many people in my career and they'd say, oh, have you been to Japan? Uh-huh. Been to China? Uh-huh. India? Uh-huh. They were born and raised in some little town in Wisconsin. And they don't even know what, this, what the next state is. Yeah, they've never been out of their own bubble. Never. So they don't know what's going on in the world, nor do they care. They're just watching the Green Bay Packer game and going down and getting their cheese curds, and that's their life. Yeah. But I can't do that, nor can I change the world. You know, I can't. I don't have the power. People like Bono, he has an impact, the things he does. And Paul McCartney, you know, there's musicians that help change the world. But I'm not in that position. You know, I might be a millionaire, but I'm not a billionaire, you know. Yeah. I can't change the world. I have to take care of my son and my daughter and my family, you know. But when you trap, these, I, I meet so many people that when they say, oh, I've never been to Texas. I'm like, you're one state away. They just... <laughs> born and raised and that's it get married and have kids and they stay in podunk arkansas yeah Almost and i'm like, like um, brainwashed stay well don't they have wanderlust i mean i've always had wanderlust yeah. no i love I'm, travel as well if i can't go there i'll read about it or i'll you know exactly now the internet is here and when I hear people about, I can't get an education and I can't get a scholarship and I couldn't go to college. And I'm like, wait a minute, hang on. Anything you want to know from the beginning of time is on the internet. You want to know about Buddhist philosophy? Click on it. You want to know about the wars? Click on it. You can medical videos, heart surgeons. It's all on the internet. So when I hear people go, oh, I'm just going to be a gangbanger and go sell crack. 
in fentanyl because uh, I couldn't afford to go to college. You can educate yourself. The internet, it's all there. So it's all there. All the information's there. You can you have to re go read it. Rewire your house. Watch porn. Yeah, you want to you watch can... porn or you want to watch, you know, an educational video on spirituality or finance or stock market. I mean, or you just want to watch porn yeah. or watch Kim Kardashian that their youngest sister now is a billionaire. And when I saw that, I went, did they say billion or million? No, billion. The youngest Kardashian now is a billionaire. She's 25. I'm selling makeup that she makes in Canada. Ships from China. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so I, I, you know, remember MTV was all 24 hours a day, rock and roll. It was an escape. Now it's Jersey snore, Shore and everybody wants to talk about Schnooky's boobs or she had a baby and, and you know, um, I, I can't watch that stuff. No, I think we're both dumbed down. We're dumbing down. Huge, yeah. Well, the, the reality shows are just, I mean, I just don't understand the appeal. They've got a different one out every day, um, you know. When, I remember when they came out with that one show, um, Mom and Eight and Kate and Eight or somebody, she had like eight kids or twins or it's like. Yep, yep, they had eight kids and then they got divorced. and Or you watch this 90 Day Fiance. Yeah, that stuff for sure. What the hell's that about? Well, we knew each other three months and we met on the internet and we're going to get married and they film it all and they fall apart. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Or these, yeah, these people have eight kids and they do a reality show and inevitably after two seasons, they get divorced. Yeah, the kids get taken into children's aid. It's just, I don't get it. You know, it wasn't my generation. Even though I came from a poor background, lived in an orphanage, raised in foster homes, you know, I was obsessed from getting out of that. I could have joined a gang or started selling drugs or whatever. I worked two jobs. You know, your future is in your hands. You don't get a certificate when you're born. It says, Don you are guaranteed to be happy the rest of your life and you will have lots of money and you'll live in a big house and have wonderful children. It's guaranteed. It doesn't work that way. So now what you say I, is you'll be happy and you own nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it's coming down to. Um, it's sad. So, but it makes me lucky that when people, I have so many musicians ask me how I made it. And I said, maybe 50% talent and 50% luck. Right place, right time, right club, right person saw me. There was thousands of bands in Hollywood, hundreds. Why did Dawkins make it? I don't know. I just tried to write the best songs I could. Yep. And the right person saw us and gave us a record deal for a whopping, uh, for breaking the chains, I got $8,500. And that was to be split between the band members and everything? No, there was no band then. Oh. When I got signed, there was no George, Jeff, or Mick. It was just me. Okay. I had just finished singing the background vocals, some of the background vocals on the Scorpions album, Blackout. And Dieter said, let's use the Studio B and do some demos. So me and Michael did some demos. The manager from Accept, Gabby Halk, I give her all the credit, took my cassette to a record company, and she came back and handed me a plane ticket. And she said, oh, and he's offering you 20,000 marks. I said, how much is that in the U.S.? <laughs> About $8,500, but he'll pay for the record. I said, $8,500? That'll pay my rent for like seven months. You know, was... it's just right time for the right place. Uh, so when you um, when this album drops, you're obviously, you've got Japan scheduled, you've got Europe. Um, last time I saw you, I don't know if you remember, I know you've done thousands of shows. It was, you guys played with Firehouse in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. You flew in from Toronto, and you might remember the show because my friend Al, Alexander, shout out to him, Robin who had hired you guys, flew you in from Toronto. Then when you're flying out, Al drove you guys out to our Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario airport. When you got there, you found out you were booked out of Michigan. Do you remember that show? No. Okay. I do. I remember being in Canada and, this taking, and them taking us to the wrong airport. 
Well, that's what I'm saying. My my buddy Al drove you guys out to that airport. I remember that, and I went, "What?" And then you're you get long airport. I'm like, "Oh shit!" Because my road manager didn't read the. Yeah, he said back. he said you were pissed. He goes, "Oh yeah, he was on the phone yelling at his manager pretty good." So yeah, he flew beyond pissed, beyond pissed because we were stuck there. Yeah, you guys had to stay. Um, was you stayed later the day, or did you stay overnight one more? We had to get a hotel. Yeah. Yeah, and then the next day you flew out of Michigan. We got out. We got out of the right airport. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So but what a screw up on my road manager. I'm like, I'm not paying attention. That's his job. Yeah. Long airport. Well, two cities named the same names of the the cities, so maybe that was a confusion. But anyways. yeah, the same name, but wrong airport. Yeah. Um, is there any plans on coming back up to Canada to support the new album, Don? I would love to. Uh, we've always struggled in Canada because they have this law that people might not know about that the radio and all that in the 80s had to pay play 60% content of Canadian bands. Well, con can. Con can. I'm like, what? I said, yeah. So you had bands like Honeymoon Suite, Aldo Nova, Blue Oyster Cult. They're Canadian bands and they got tons of airplay. So we would tour with Aldo Nova and Blue Oyster Cult and and uh, Lover Boy, Killer Dwarfs. I'm like, what? Yeah, Killer Dwarfs. I said, so why doesn't the radio station play American bands? It's a law. I said, it's a law because the Canadian government said we have to, you know, promote Canadian artists. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense, you know. So we couldn't break out in Canada. So we did the Bloister Cult tour, and we did Lover Boy tour, and you know, but we just could never break out and get established in Canada because the radio stations would just play us maybe one of our songs once a day. So we yeah. could never get our foothold into Canada. I remember playing with Aldo Nova. And he had that uh, life is just a fantasy, don't you? Oh, want I love that song. Yeah, fantasy life. Uh, it was Dawkin, Aldonova, and Blister Colt on our first arena tour. And then you know Aldo went on uh, to produce Celine Dion. Yeah, and, and with Bon Jovi, and she, or I mean, she, yeah, but and she and she hadn't made it yet, but he made millions off Celine Dion. So, again, right place, right time. Very talented guy, you know, and his career kind of ended. But the money he made between Bon Jovi or Celine Dion, you know, he's set for life. Yeah, been well, in those, uh, he actually just played uh, in the last couple weekends at St. Charles, Illinois. Wow. Yeah, he uh, he's back, and he sounded great, too, so... I, I'm like you. I understood how uh, Aldenova kind of went silent, but he didn't. He just kept writing and recording other bands and, you know, writing for them. So he didn't just leave the industry, but he no, left. No, he just went underground. Yeah, he left uh, performing. But yeah, like I said, about two or three weeks ago, he played St. Charles um, and a few other shows. And somebody, Jason Mapes, a friend of mine, he uh, uploaded on Facebook um, uh, all those in one of his songs. I was like, holy shit, he hasn't lost it. No, he's a great musician, and and you know, Celine Dion. Up to the time he found her, she had all these hit records, but she sang in French. That's right. So she couldn't get out. She was stuck. She was. She sings French. She's French, and she finally made uh, records in English. And Aldo Nova, you know, you get your three points, and when you sell millions of records, the producer gets a piece of that. So Aldo Nova. I went to his house. I can't remember if it was Toronto or Ontario. Mont had Montreal. A, Montreal. He had a beautiful condominium there. And then he unraveled uh, Aldo for a while. He ended up, you know, in the drugs and mental hospitals. And he had his hard times too. Yeah. But we just tried so hard to tour Canada because you asked about that. And apparently you have to tour the, either Honeymoon Suite or some band like that or you can't book a tour because you're american very strange law yeah 
it's um it, it, I think they've overhauled it in the last so many years. I think Brian Adams has something to do with that. He spoke at the uh the uh, Brian Canadian. Adams, Canadian. Yeah, right? well, he spoke to overhaul that rule because he didn't uh it was it was concan and it was how much percentage of English and how much percentage of um foreign content was so anyways, long story short, but um, you have a lot of fans up here, Don. Let you know that um, much music was really good for that. We had the Power Hour. Yeah. So there's a lot of fans that love to see you up here. Um, so if you can swing it, that'd be great. If not, I'm on a border. I'm in the on a border city uh, with Michigan. So I'd love to go see you in the in the states. Um, I love in Canada. We'd like we'd like to go back before I retire, like and just at least play Toronto and Montreal and Ontario and. Saskatchewan, all those at least four or five cities. And uh, you know, it's just but a lot of fans don't realize that American bands are, you know, have a hard time getting to Canada because you're not Canadian. That's right. Yeah. But some old geezer, 80 year old geezer passed that law. Yeah, and, and and these days we can't even get our news broadcast because we got censorship rules up here in Canada. So we'll be sure to let them know. That's why, if you haven't been up here in the last so many years, that's why. Um, you have censorship? Oh, fuck yeah. It's called Bill C-18. That's not right. No, it's pretty bad. Um, if we try to share news on Facebook, it'll come up. News cannot be shared because of the Canadian Parliament's legislation. No shit. That's wrong. Yeah, this is in the last two years this has come about. Just as the shit show... Around the world's happened since 2019. It's pretty bad. So they're, gonna, so they're going to decide what people can see and hear and yeah. decide their because, future. Yeah, we're too illiterate, apparently, to decide what's what's accurate. The government's going to decide. Yeah. But same thing in America now. I used to watch our local station. And, of course, there was always the battle between Fox News and CNN. Fox News was like, you know, Trump, 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 Trump. And then CNN was more liberal. And now uh, I can't turn it on every five minutes. Trump, 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 Trump. Trump must be laughing his ass off because he's getting millions and millions of dollars in free press. This guy's got like, what, 29 felonies against him. And he's running for president. But, you know, if one of those he gets convicted of, you can't run for president. You can't be a president with a felony. Yeah. Yeah. He's trying to push it all back till after the election. But then, you know, I look and I says, uh, there's eight people running in America, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, Trump, 49%, Biden, 50 So it looks like it's going to come down to our senile president or Trump. Yeah. Uh, Trump, I'm moving. I'm going to France. Yeah, a lot. Of, actually, who lives in France? Chris Holmes of Wasp. Chris, uh, yeah. Biff Bufford, Saxon. And I'm serious. I'm already look. I've been looking. I'm going to buy a home in France and get the hell out of here. You know? Yeah, we can still chat this way, right? That's with Zoom. It's worldwide. I've been doing all the countries in Europe for two weeks nice. on Zoom. But I'm I'm afraid. You know, I mean, there's sh- our laws should be changed. When you see the Congress and they're all been senators and congressmen, they're all 80 years old. No, there should be some a term limit of four years or something like that. Or cognitive ability limit, like a test every so many. It's just like a driving test. When you hit 70 or 80, it's like, okay, every three years as a safeguard, you get your eyes checked. I mean, it's yep. just one of those things. If you're 75 and you've been in this, like I'm not speaking for Americans, I'm a Canadian, but in our parliament here, I don't know what our limitations are, but I know in the, the Senate and the House, um, I think you have a term for life. If yes. We, so, yeah. Like, like the Supreme Court. We have a channel here in America, and you can watch the Congress. And and you can see all these people. And you, and you see the camera pan around. It looks like they're all ready to drop dead any minute. You know, and they can't talk without a teleprompter. And we have this new thing going on with this Senator Menendez. Who oh, I saw that. He was accused of bribery and fraud 10 years ago. And it was a hung jury. And now, last week, they raided his house. They found hundreds of thousands of dollars in his house. Cash. Gold bars. Gold bars hidden in his clothes. Yeah. Because people would go to him and say, I'll give you $100,000, $200,000. I'll 
I'll give your wife this. Uh, they just found out they had some people paying his house payments. That's, he's a traitor and he's a sitting senator. And he needs to be kicked out. He's corrupt. But everybody's talking about it, but nothing's happened. Well, we'll see if he gets convicted. Then we'll kick him out. And he's like in a very, very high position in the government. And he's a crook. But, you know, luckily there are people that dig for that stuff. We have to amend our constitution and amend the laws. And I don't think anybody 80 years old should be passing laws about abortion, pro-life, against life. You know, it's not right. Everybody should have their own decision. You know, not some geezer that's suffering from Alzheimer's. That, yeah. You know, Supreme Court stuck down Roe versus Wade. You know, you're allowed to have an abortion. But I say, well, what happens if a woman gets raped by five guys and she's 18? She is forced to have that baby and raise that baby the rest. Her life is ruined. Ruined. You know, yeah, and she doesn't from, know who the father is. Just from the trauma, from the rape. Yeah, and she's raped. She doesn't know who the father is. And now we've all banned it in America on over 40 states that no more abortion. And I'm like, who would have thought that would happen? And they have to drive to another state that's still legal or to go into an alley, you know, and get an underground doctor. It's not right. And yeah. risk dying of, um, you know, bleeding out. I mean, it's... Yeah. Yeah, he sticks a knitting needle up you and pops the, you know. Yeah, but you have the Bible thumpers and the hardcore right and the Christians saying, you know, God decides, you know, you can't terminate a baby. And I'm like, she was raped, and she's 16. Her life is ruined. She has the right to get an abortion, and these are the things that upset me. Mm -hmm. But I realize maybe I am to blame somewhat because I just dropped out and moved out of LA and I live up in a mountain in the middle of nowhere and no neighbors. I'm just like, I'm just watching the world unravel. You know, uh, people it's listen to you, Don, movies. like you, you got a good platform. So you're saying earlier about um, kind of, I forget what you're alluding to, but I'm kind of just trying to allude back to you that you're doing something just by your own speaking because you're educating people. If I speak, I educate other people. If they speak, so wherever we hear people at least voicing their opinions, that's a channel of doing something. So, you know. Yeah, respect my opinion. You know, we have a half a million, I have a half a million followers on Facebook. So what I say, some people take to heart, but I'm not trying to change the world. Everybody has to make up their own mind. But, and then I try not to be too political or, I get attacked because you've got half the United States love Donald Trump, you know? So if I say anything negative against him, then I've got half millions of people to say, screw you. You know, I don't know what to say. You know, I'm, I, I say, I, I, we talk about on the road. I say, I, sometimes I feel like I'm overeducated because I know what's going on, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And people are just so, Kardashians, 90 day fiance, my 600 pound life of these obese people, they're going to die if they don't lose 200 pounds. And that show has been going for four seasons. And I get the psychology. If you look at someone that's really down and out, 600 pounds, they say, I haven't been out of bed in four years. Well, how'd you get to 600 pounds? Because their mother and father enabled them and brought them six cheeseburgers three times a day you know uh my girlfriend has type 1 diabetes that is genetic onset adult type 2 diabetes we have something like 30 million people that have it and we're the our system is supporting them because they can't work and type 2 diabetes is very cur curable just stop shoving chocolate cake in your mouth type 2 is from the way you eat Eat healthy and you'll you won't have diabetes, you know. Type one's a different thing. That's genetic. Yeah. Uh I talked about that with uh uh the singer in Poison. We were on tour with him with Brett. He's got type one, juvenile diabetes. And he goes, When I see all these millions of people, especially in the poor states, and they're five hundred pounds, 
I don't have a lot of sympathy. You know, you're killing yourselves. So they go to the government and they get welfare. I can't work because I can't walk. I can't get out of bed. You know, I mean, well, put that hamburger down. You know, I mean, for God's sakes. Like I said, we're all in control in my beliefs, in my spiritual beliefs, that we're all in control of our own destiny. You know, unless you're drafted and you go to Afghanistan. Right. Like the whole Afghanistan thing. I don't think the young generation cares that it was the longest war we ever had for 20 years. And all those people had died. We tried to save Afghanistan. And what was it? Four months and the Taliban took over the whole country. It was 20 years of war wasted. Oh, you mean at the end? Yeah. The end. They just took over. Now yeah. the Taliban run the country. And they passed a new law two weeks ago that if the women don't wear their burqas, which is your a hijab on your head properly, you can do 10 years in prison if if your hijab on your head's not put on properly. Or they had the old thing of like if the wind blows and and you know your your black skirt blows up and you can see your leg and they go, ah, God's saying you're you know, you're a slut. And they can be stoned to death legally. Or husbands to say, I think she's cheating. But the law says, yeah, but you're not allowed to kill your wife. You can just have a family member kill her. What the hell? That's, you know? that's insane. And they yeah, can, you can have a wife stoned to death just because he thinks you're screwing the guy at the bakery. Or this whole hijab thing, these women like the woman that died in prison because she didn't have her head covering on properly, as they said. And they arrested her and beat her to death in prison. So that just reminds me that we live in America and we've got a great country all in all. Yeah, we, but there's so much terrible things going on. Yeah, here in the West, we're pretty lucky. <clears throat> Even the yeah. problems we're having here in Canada, like right now, we're still pretty lucky. So, yeah. I love Canada, but I don't think the new generation, when I talk to my son or daughter and say, you know what's going on in Afghanistan? You know what's going on? You know that Vladimir Putin is a mass murderer, right? He was the KGB, and he's been in office for 20 years because anybody who runs against him magically gets poisoned or shot. You can't run against Putin. He'll have you killed. You know, you can't talk in, on the press or the radio. They'll arrest you and kill you. You know, it's a dictatorship. It's communist. They have no free speech. And... That's why we're fighting, you know, because if they take over the Ukraine, he'll just keep going to Poland and keep going and keep going because he wants the oil. He wants a landlock to get his oil pipelines through the Ukraine because right now he has to take his ships and ship all the oil around the Baltic Sea. This is all about oil. It's all about money. It's, yeah, it always why, is about money. That's why we're supporting the Ukraine. And people don't realize that the Ukraine eight years ago was part of Russia and they left. It's only been eight years, you know, when they annexed themselves for Russia and now Putin wants it back and people are dying and God bless the Ukrainians. They're fighting tooth and nail, man. They're like, you're not taking our country. You know, I like that uh, segue with tooth and nail. Yeah, it is tooth and nail. And you know what? Those people are tough. They were raised in World War II where they got slaughtered and their families. And right. they're not going to, you know, what did Putin say a year ago? He said, yeah, we'll be in Kiev in five days. Oh, well, <laughs> year and a half later, uh, you're wrong. Yeah, you know, the, the, the Ukrainians, opposed, they're very strong people. Mm. And they're like, you're not taking our country. And you're not going to tell us what to say, what to do, you know. Fuck that guy, Putin. Somebody's put a bullet in his head. You know, and that's my opinion, you know? Yeah. Um, I won't keep you much longer, Don. This has been great. Right. You know what? We don't even yeah, have We got to sidetracked on politics to talk hey, about the You know record. what? This is going to be a great interview for people to watch because we don't have to go into the George shit and we don't have to go into uh, anything else. So this was great. Yeah, that's ancient history, man. It's all yeah. now. All water under the bridge. So last question. What is the opposite of unsubscribe? I don't know the answer. Unsubscribe. What's the opposite? Like spam? No, no. What's the opposite of the word unsubscribe? Subscribe. 
That's right. Everybody do is a legendary singer, guitar player, songwriter, Don Dawkins says, and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. Album drops October 27th. Um, what um, label is it on? Uh, uh, it's called Silver Lining Records. Okay. Uh, fairly new label. They have Saxon, Dora Pesh, Iron Maiden. They have a lot of great rock bands. Okay, I'll put a link underneath the description box for that for people to go and get the album, download it. Um, yeah. I'll also put the links to your shows coming up. And I think there's one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, and I think that's about it. Anything and to people say can pre-order the record. You can pre-order it in about a week. And we're, you know, we're putting the album out on vinyl. Vinyl's making a huge comeback. It is. Yeah. Well, I, I, was, I was raised with vinyl. If there, if you have a good enough turntable and needle, it's, it's, I think it's better than digital. Oh yeah. There's something kind of a. Uh, Romantic. Romantic, you, know, you take your record out, you pull out the sleeve, you read the lyrics and pictures, yeah. put the album on, drop the needle, and kick back and check it out. Yeah, I remember did. that when I, I bought uh, Sad Wings of Destiny by Judas Priest, and I would play that album all day long. And then it always bothered me. I couldn't afford a turntable. It would automatically start again. And I had to go and take the needle and start it over. <laughs> and I tell my friends, you got to come over and check out this album called Sad Wings of Destiny by Judas Priest. And I'm like, who? I'm like, they're European. They hadn't made it in America yet. So is that, that one of your favorite albums would be, uh, you'd go back to if you had to say a favorite album would be Sad Wings absolutely. of Destiny? Yeah. Sad Wings of Destiny and Saxon's, uh, the album that had that, I uh, can't remember the title of the album. We had that song, uh, 747 coming out of the night. They had a song, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. One of their albums. And I've been so happy. And I, I when I met Biff at the Bakken Festival, and I told him, I just want you to know, I was listening to you before you guys even got famous. I loved Saxon. And I loved Accept. And I loved the song Balls of the Wall. And I loved the Scorpions. I bought, you know, Fly of the Rainbow and Tokyo Tapes. And, and my friends are going, who? Who? And I'm like, oh boy, you know, because they weren't, they hadn't made it in America yet. They were playing, they came the first time, played clubs. But I was always into European bands. That's why I went to Europe because I got tired of the cheesy new wave, people wearing plates on their head and pointy boots and shark skin jackets. And I was like, what's this all about? And then he had the punk movement. Yeah. You know, I mean, you had a great band like Black Flag and mm -hmm. Pennywise, and they all recorded at my studio. So you had a lot of it going on. You had the hard rock, you had the punk, you had the new wave. I remember I went to see Devo at the Whiskey, and I checked them out. And I was like, I'm not my cup of tea, but I checked them out because they were getting famous. And the next week, we were playing at the Starwood, and I saw the singer and guitar player came to Dawkins' show. And after the show, I said, why did you why did you guys come to see us and the singer said because you represent everything we don't want to be <laughs> oh is that right this coming i'll never forget that things. that was a backhanded compliment yeah i was just gonna you say know, hard rock and long hair and leather jackets it was like you represent everything we don't want to be that's they 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 want to be they just uh i don't know it's one of those things when the, remember the punk rockers and the, the hard rockers I mean, yep. you'd almost get in fights <laughs> because yeah. you're not passionate. It's like, holy shit, man. It's just like, this is racism, but It was. It was like racism music liking. Yeah. So I'm grateful. Like I said, we played the other night, 7,000 people. I saw 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 50-year-olds. Our fan base in Dawkins is spread out through like two generations now. Mm -hmm. Even people have gotten older. And you know, had families and bought a house, got a job, and they want to get away on the weekend and go. Man, I I love Dawkins in the eighties. I'm gonna go see him, and they bring their kids with them, and I see yeah, them. They're seeing every lyric that I ever wrote, and that makes me very grateful that those songs have stood the test of time. Exactly. Yeah. We still play "Breaking the Chains" in our set. Well, I wrote it over to. years ago, forty years ago, and I always I say. It. It's a great song still. It is a great song, yeah. Paris is, is Burning, another great one. Paris is Burning. It's been 40, over 40 years. 
Wow. So a lot of the bands from my genre, you know, they had their one hit and they're gone. Yeah. I have a list. You know, there's a million bands that had that one hit on MTV and a great video and they disappeared. So I'm very grateful that we've had such a great career since 1982. And uh, I can thank MTV for that. And playing, being on American Bandstand with, you know, Dick Clark. And, and we toured endlessly for a year and a half at a time. You know, we, we won our fans one at a time. We were never an overnight sensation. I'm grateful. All right, boss, you take care. All right, well, thanks again, uh, Don. Um, it, was, it was a pleasure and looking forward to the album. And everybody check out the album. And um, yeah, make sure you catch Dawkins on tour. 